so uh, maybe uh, before continuing ahead let me briefly review what we have done so far so so far we we started with our uh, journey of data science by uh, by learning the basics of python we further addressed the basics of uh, different packages that we may be that we may use within our data science journey uh, which includes numpy pandas matplotlib seaborn even scikit-learn we did data preprocessing within data preprocessing we saw that there are multiple things uh, data cleaning uh, transformation feature engineering uh, binning discretization and all those things which gets the data prepared for the modeling phase finally once the data is prepared in the modeling phase we did uh, supervised learning and within supervised learning we saw two kinds of uh, solutions one is called as classification the other is called as regression within the classification category we saw algorithms like knn uh, decision trees naive bayes and the forest uh, and then we did certain examples like Titanic, uh, heart disease prediction, and so on. We then shifted gears towards regression. We saw how regression works. We saw the hypothesis, the cost, the gradient descent methodology. We saw how to implement linear regression from scratch. We additionally saw uh, 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 terms like overfitting, underfitting, uh, we saw how to use regularization by using the lambda parameter for lasso and bridge. And we did an example uh, with house price detection, that is the Boston price, house pricing data. Now we have moved into something called as unsupervised learning. And uh, we will see how, how this works out. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions uh, before we continue uh, into unsupervised learning? In that case, let me let me start discussing uh, regarding unsupervised learning. So, within this approach of unsupervised learning, we will look at uh, our what is clustering. We'll look at different approaches for clustering. Uh, we'll see two major uh, uh, approaches. One is exclusive. One is agglomerative. And we'll see two different algorithms. Uh, and we we'll, we'll, we'll try to get an idea of how these algorithms are working. And we'll also see our cluster validity problem and how we can use an index like Davies Bolden index to to get or uh, or how to use that metric to identify how good or how bad our clustering solution looks like. And uh, let's start here. So maybe let let, let me ask you a few questions uh, and 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 then I'll, I'll proceed ahead. Uh, one basic question would mean, uh, what do you understand by supervised learning? Since we are going into unsupervised, it makes sense to, to be really clear what do we mean by supervised learning. Any ideas? Uh, if we tell the data uh, what to do, that is supervised data, supervised learning. Mm -hmm. So tell the data what to do. Uh, can you expand that a little more? Uh, if what is each data is whether it is classified, mm -hmm. if it is okay. labeled, okay, great. So if the data is labeled, we say that it is supervised learning. Okay, uh, great. Any other answers for supervised learning? Uh, if you define whether it is. Uh, Classification or uh, regression, how the grouping happens. Great. So, supervised learning is basically classification and regression. And what is the difference between classification and regression? If it is continuous, it is regression. If it is categorical, it is classification. Great. So, uh, what is continuous or what is categorical? The target label. Yep. So categorical or continuous uh, 
the, the label basically. If the label is uh, categorical, we go for classification. If the label is continuous, we go for regression. Excellent. So let's see then, uh, or maybe let, let me also uh, try to explain supervised learning in, in one more way, which is something that I have started to understand as uh, more representative of the data. So let me try to look at this. Thing. So we have a system and, and the system has certain number of inputs. Let me call x1, x2, x3, x4, and it gives a certain output. Okay. Uh, these inputs are basically the features of our data. And the output is our target. Whether it is uh, uh, whether it is uh, a classification a categorical target or discontinuous target, independent of that, this is what we are trying to do. We have some kind of data which we say goes into some kind of system, and it gives us an output. So the system can represent so many things. Let's say for our hard uh, for our Titanic data set. The, date, the features that we go inside is age, gender, fair, class, and so on. What we get outside is survived or not survived. So this system represents, given this input, what, how is my output distributed or how is my output being affected? And this system for us is a black box. We, we really don't know uh, how, based on these features, uh, for the Titanic data set, we, we get an output as survived or not survived. And then to represent the system, we are trying to fit different strategies, or we are trying to, we are trying to put, or we are trying to explain this system using multiple methods. Okay. So we use methods like KN, and we can say that maybe KNN is a good fit for the system. KNN is nearest, uh, K nearest neighbors. So since we have lots of known data, we will see the mapping of known features to known data. And we'll see the distances between data points, okay, between survived and between dead. And we will say that, let me try and use KNN as a system to explain what this main system looks like. I don't have any idea of what the system is, but I can try to represent the system using KNN. And if I do that, I want to find the link between this and this. Or we say, let me try something like, Knife case, or decision trees, or random forest, or SVM, or logistic integration. So these are all uh, our attempts to try to explain the system using different strategies. And uh, hopefully, our aim is that one of these strategies will sufficiently represent the system so that we will get sufficiently good answers. How do we know we are getting sufficiently good answers? So we do methods like we do, we check training accuracy, we check validation accuracy. Training accuracy helps us know that, okay, for the same data, for data that I know what the answers are, and I have told my system what those answers are, is my system able to still represent that, that is our training accuracy? Or we can check validation accuracy, which basically says that uh, I will train my data with I will train my system with known data, but for some of the data, which I actually know the answer for, I will not show the answer to my system, but I will test it on it. So in that sense, we get some idea of how the system will behave on unseen cases. And uh, that, that gives us a fair idea of how good or how bad is our, uh, our, our algorithm. Okay. So, this is a black box. This is a system that we cannot see, but we can check the inputs. We can check the outputs and based on the inputs and outputs, we can try to represent this system using one of these algorithms. And hopefully these algorithms would sufficiently represent the mapping from input to output. And uh, then we can, if we have a very good mapping, then for unseen data, for new data, we can use the same mapping and predict, predict our answers. So I find this is a, probably a fairly good representation of what supervised learning is doing. Okay. 
Is this fine? Uh, yes, it's clear. Okay. So let me then move towards unsupervised learning, which basically says that my data now, uh, in the new case, my data will be unlabeled. Which basically says that I have these features x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, but I don't have a corresponding y. Okay. This y does not exist, or at least we don't have access to this y. Okay. So, uh, okay. Just just as a random guess, can you can you tell which case uh, like from all the data that we have available uh, generally? Uh, do, would we have more of uh, labeled data or would we have more of unlabeled data? Unlabeled data. Yes. Right. And uh, access to unlabeled data will be much, much, much more than our access to labeled data. Okay. And that is generally the scenario. So labeled data expects that we know the mapping that we want. And uh, not just knowing the mapping, we also know what the uh, we also know uh, the answer that we are interested in, and we know that the answer is categorical or regression, categorical or continuous, and so on. So unlabeled data is uh, uh, generally much easier to find. Labeled data is we know that someone has taken the pains of labeling the data. So by nature, we don't automatically get labeled data. Again, depending from situation to situation. So, so the problem of solving for unlabeled data is actually a very relevant problem. And the reason it is relevant is because we have more access to unlabeled data. So if you go to a company and you're trying to solve a problem for that company, you would see that you would have loads and loads of data. Okay. The problem is, most or majority of that data is unlabeled. So uh, we end up saying that, okay, since it is unlabeled, we are stuck. We cannot, we cannot use supervised learning algorithms because supervised learning algorithms expect for us a target class, ex ex uh, expect that they have labeled data. Uh, here within unsupervised, uh, even when we don't have labeled data, we can, we can do a lot of things from that data. One of the things we can do is, uh, the task to learn the classification or grouping from that data. Okay. Even though we do not have labels to that data, we can, we can try to find inherent patterns between the data points. And we can see, can these data points be grouped together or classified together? Okay. Uh, let me share with you an example of uh, unsupervised learning uh, or the task of classifying without having a label. So you may have used uh, Google Photos. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, <laughs> okay. I use it quite often. So uh, uh, I know uh, how it works. I know what the interface is and so on. So one of the features of Google Photos is uh, once you have a load of photos on your website, on your Google Photos account, uh, there is a section called as peoples and pets. Like, interestingly, they have clubbed it together like this, peoples and pets. And what Google would do is from your entire library of photos, it is able to first identify faces of people. And it is able to say that this is a face and this is not a face. So from your entire photo section, it will region out the different faces of people. And similar looking faces, it would group as one, even though Google may not know the name of that person, but all similar looking images, it will group under one unnamed profile. And if you go to your people's and pets section, you will see that there are multiple faces and Google actually does a very, uh, a very good job. That is, if you open one such uh, profile, you will see that all images actually belong to that one person. So this would, this will be an application of unsupervised learning where we have photos, uh, we have the data and Google operates on the, uh, we have not labeled the data. I have not labeled uh, in every photo, which, how many people are there? What are the names of people and which are, which are those people, but Google without even labeling the data, 
uh, with unlabeled images or unlabeled data, it is able to cluster or classify or group similar looking items together. Okay. Uh, and the way it works basically is using something called as clustering algorithms, which we'll be looking at here. Of course, Google does much more than that. Uh, we will limit our discussion to basic clustering for now. So that is one example of clustering or grouping uh, different forms of data. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, clustering basically is the process of grouping similar objects together. So even if we uh, think when we say similar objects, uh, what comes to mind, right? So when we say similar objects, we are basically talking about some features that are uh, very close to each other. Okay. So let's say, uh, example, a group of people clustered based on height and weight. Okay. So if we see people with similar height, we can say, okay, I'm actually similar objects means I'm I'm trying to compare the objects via the proxy of the features that they have. Okay. So for our iris data set, uh, features like sepal width, sepal length, petal width, petal length are proxies uh, which can be used to represent similar kinds of flower genes or similar kinds of flower categories. So the three categories that we were looking at was I think uh, virginica, setosa and uh, versicolor. And, uh, we are using uh, the features to help us identify how similar looking flowers would look like. Okay. Similarly, even with the unsupervised case, we are trying to look at different features like height or weight or a combination of them, uh, a combination of height and weight that can help us to identify if an object is similar or not. So this measure of similarity generally can be done with two ways. We can use something called as a distance measure. We can use something called as conceptual measure. A distance measure is actually very natural and very easy to do. Uh, we can, if we have uh, our data features in the form of numbers, we can find the distance between objects. Uh, something like we did with KNN. So KNN, uh, we were saying that to this object, to this data point, who are the neighbors? And once we know what the who the neighbors are, we can see. Uh, depending upon what is their class, we can decide the class for this new data point. Similarly, within the clustering approach, we can measure the distance and between data points. And depending on the distance between data points, we can say, do they belong to one group or not? Maybe we do not know what the class of that group is, but hopefully uh, they are similar enough that we can classify them as one object. Now, Distance can be measured again in multiple ways. We can use Euclidean or Manhattan or, or there are several other methods like Minoski and so on. Euclidean basically says that we will be using something called as the L2 norm for finding the distance. Manhattan uses the L1 norm, which is basically distance between two points. Like let's say our points are X1, X2. So you can say uh, the, the, mod, the absolute of X1 minus X2 for each of the features and here, for uh, Euclidean, it would mean something like this, x1 minus x2 for each of the features, uh, it's square, it's sum, and then it's square root, it's something like that. So that would be in the Euclidean between uh, the two uh, data points. Uh, these are easy options. Other options are things like conceptual measures. Conceptual measures are uh, let's say uh, I have age, but instead of numbers, I have groups of ages like uh, teenagers, young, adult, and so on. And we are seeing that can these group, how close are these groups of ages? Okay. So uh, if I have two people like young and young, okay, they are close to each other. Two people like senior and senior, they are close to each other. Or we can have conceptual measures like uh, occupation. Uh, engineers, doctors, lawyers, so on. So uh, the idea is that these measures, they cannot be represented very effectively using numbers. We may try to represent them using numbers. That is, we will say, uh, let males be zeros, females be one, or let uh, uh, 
the different categories of ages B0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So we are assigning some neighbors, but numbers, but uh, it, still it is very, it's very difficult to identify things using numbers. So let's say if I use words like good, bad, right, wrong, uh, how do I assign these guys numbers and how do I test them? So uh, when, when we go to something called as just text analytics, we use uh, concepts like word to vec uh, and we use concepts like uh, I think inverse cosine transform which helps us to identify how far or how close these concepts are. But generally uh, these conceptual measures are quite difficult to, to explain to the model and thus also to for us to understand uh, how to cluster them together. Okay. Now within this clustering approach uh, let, let me look at an example of distance-based clustering. If I have my data like this, where I have two features, uh, x1 and x2, and this is how my data looks like. Uh, for unsupervised learning, for supervised learning, we could use something like color. We could say that uh, maybe half of these data points are red, half of these data points are blue. That would be the label to them. But in this case, we do not have unsupervised learning, we don't have access to labels. We just have features and to those features, we can see the distribution of our data. And if we ask how, how can we cluster them, there are several ways we could try to do that. Okay. One of these examples are shown here where we say, let me combine these together, these together, these together, these together, these two together. And then I neatly have five different clusters. So it seems okay, it seems fine. We can, we can do something like this. They are close to each other. We can form one cluster. And here we said that let us form five clusters. So we have one, two, three, four, five, fair enough. But let's say if I ask the question, uh, instead of five clusters, I want four clusters. In that sense, we would have to do a, either a different form of clustering or we could merge two clusters together. We could say that, okay, this is one cluster, this, and one, two, three, four, that can be one option. Or we can have one, two, three, four, or we can have one, two, three, four, and so on. Which is basically what I've tried to show here, that if the question is make four clusters, we could try to merge them in a different fashion, which, which interestingly brings, us, brings to us the very logical question, which one is right? How do I say, is this better or this better or this better? Or maybe four clusters is not the way to go. Five clusters is the only option and so on. Okay. Uh, which is again, an interesting question to ask. And uh, that is probably one of the things that uh, unsupervised learning uh, creates a problem for, for data scientists to know which answer is the right answer. For supervised learning, it is, it is very clear because we have access to the label data. Thus, we know what is the right answer. Thus, we can try to learn the pattern. But for unsupervised learning, where we don't really know what are the two clusters, when we try to cluster them, where do we stop? Do we, we say this one is right, this one is right, this one is right, this one is right. We don't know. Right? So then we can go ahead and we can try to see how we can decide how many clusters. So one, uh, we can decide how many clusters depending upon intrinsic grouping, okay? depending upon what is the true pattern within the data. Am I trying to force four clusters to the data or am I trying to force five clusters to the data? Or is there a way where we can look at the, look at the pattern uh, from the data points and we can, uh, we can see what is the intrinsic grouping within the data points. So something like, if I uh, collect uh, loads of medical data from people, maybe like height, blood group, uh, 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 ages, and so on, can I actually use that data to, to cluster between the different genders, males and females? Will, will that be a natural pattern that comes out of the data or not? Okay. So it, it, it's asking questions like this. What is intrinsic to the data? and how we can find this true pattern. Okay. So that sh this basically should help us decide how many clusters. Okay. 
what is true for the data and if if we have ways of either visualizing it if features are less of course we can visualize the data and we can see uh, how things work out so if i have let's say if i have just two features x and y and i can see my data uh, looks something like this then it is very easy for me to tell that oh there are two clusters within this data okay. one cluster looks here one cluster looks here because they are closely spaced uh, and there is a good amount of distance between the other clusters that helps us to identify that okay these are two clusters that we can separate okay so we are trying to ask the question how many clusters depending upon intrinsic grouping so intrinsic grouping here clearly says that this could be a scenario but if the data was more together if i have if i bridge this gap now it is very difficult to see what is the intrinsic grouping with this data okay uh, now since it is difficult to divide i could if i can divide this into two i can divide into three i can divide into maybe two and then within the two i can divide it into four parts or not uh, then it becomes a bit complex for us to see okay so it all depends upon how the data is spaced now which also brings to the next question that this thus is very subjective okay different data scientists would come up with different answers uh, forget data scientists different people would come up with different answers okay what what strategy of grouping works for one may not work for someone else thus there is no best criteria as such okay why is there no best criteria because we cannot actually judge we can because we don't have access to the labels we don't know how these groupings will work out so there may not be a, a best criteria so if i ask maybe this one sample should i put it in this group or this group uh, it's a question for everyone no one would no one would be able to know a better people would try to guess something uh, that guess may or may not be right depending upon the situation so we need to at least accept the fact that for clustering uh, we may probably not have any best criteria and all of these uh, assumptions are actually very subjective and depends upon case to case in that case how how do we find an answer okay. so one attempt of getting the answer is we can probably take help from the domain expert okay depending on what the domain expert says we can use their years of knowledge to identify the different clustering things okay so uh, let, let's say we have uh, we are trying to look at chess positions and depending upon the chess positions we are trying to say that do these the, from these several different games are these strategies similar or not now if you show me a chess board and i see uh, uh, the game somewhere in the middle where where people have already made let's say 10 10 moves on both sides uh, it will be very difficult for me to probably say that what strategy each player is using okay uh, and if i look like maybe hundreds of boards still i i will be totally clueless i will not know which pattern or uh, represents what and so on but at the same time if i call uh, a chess grandmaster and i show him the same board he would be able to tell me that was uh, was there a closed opening game what is it a closed opening game is it an open opening game what was the uh, opening that both of these users uh, players may have used he may also help me to tell uh, probably uh, which which is a strong position which is not a strong position so the, the same data uh, when you show me show to me i will not be able to help uh, in either ways but someone who is an expert in the domain would be easily able to group data tell us some information regarding the data and uh, this is the information that data scientists are generally looking for which can help us classify or help us set the algorithms better okay. so uh, you you can take it in any field from probably games to sales so a sales representative would know more of his user base on what ads should be show to what kinds of people so that they will be attracted to purchase that or not uh, an engineering expert would help you tell out that looking at the uh, readings of maybe several 
uh, uh, sensors, they may be able to tell what is the present scenario, what is the operating condition, are we seeing a fault or not, uh, can we make this better, uh, is it taking more time or less time than expected. And so uh, these uh, applications will have their own domain experts, which can help the data scientists find or come up with how many clusters are required or come up with some kind of criteria, maybe not best, but some kind of criteria or these application or domain experts may probably tell us better what is the intrinsic grouping between the data. Okay. Hence, mm -hmm. uh, this domain expert, you said they will do the clustering, how, how much? So they will be also using some kind of features to do this clustering, right? Right, right. But the thing is, that can be again, we can do uh, incorporate in this and do this clustering part. Not like that. Uh, sorry, I did not understand. Can you repeat? Uh, like, uh, we'll take the example of this. You said, if a domain expert is coming and they are saying this is the move, mm -hmm. they are also following some pattern, a kind of feature. Right. So the, the difference is uh, that pattern, uh, you know, or, or the, the, the pattern identification that they are trying to do is not purely from the data alone. It comes from the years of experience and knowledge that they've accumulated from with from apart from the data. Does that make sense? So they are using a knowledge base, which is which is not present in the data to help you find out patterns. So let me uh, let me sh share an example. Uh, okay, if I just show you if, if I show to a, a child, or maybe a child would be too much. If I show you an, an image of a cat, okay, uh, looking at the image itself, you can tell me that it is a cat. Okay. Now, uh, the idea is this, that this image of the cat did not have image, did not have a label that this is a cat or not. Okay. Uh, I just showed you an image and you're still able to tell me that if it's a cat or not. And this knowledge that you have acquired has happened because throughout the period of your life, you have seen many other cats uh, in many other scenarios and using that training, using that information, looking at a cat that you have just now seen for the first time image, you are still able to tell me that it is a cat. Right? Does that make sense? It's a very stupid example. Uh, but, yes, I got it. but the data that I'm showing you, the image that I'm showing you does not have information regarding the cat. It does not explain what a cat looks like. It, 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 it in fact, if, if I assume that this is the first image you're seeing, then you probably will not know anything about it. Okay. But I'm relying on the fact that your, your machine or your brain is, is trained uh, in the past on something which helps you identify what this is. Okay. So similarly for a domain expert, so if I just look at a chess game, Okay, that chess game does not have the data to help me understand what is the cluster. But I'm relying on the fact that that grandmaster has seen many other games and based on his past experience, which probably is not directly mappable. You cannot map that experience to, to, uh, to clear words or explanations. And you can use that domain experts knowledge to help us identify what features are important. What can I do with this? or can I modify these features so on to do some other, something else so that I can find group. Okay. So I don't know if you have experienced a, a, a situation in life where you know something is right or wrong or you know how to solve the problem, but it is very difficult for you to explain it to someone else. Okay. So, or uh, it is very difficult to write a set of rules that will help people to solve this problem. So sometimes I, I face that problem. Uh, so, uh, especially with, uh, let's say if I'm, if I'm tuning a closed loop system. So I know what features to look at, uh, and uh, based on the features, based on the error or based on the output, I will either change the value of the proportional controller. I will change either the value of integral controller. And uh, I know that because I've, I have tuned hundreds of closed loop systems in the past, but to a, a newcomer, who is probably just exploring or understanding closed loop systems right now, it will be very, very difficult for me to explain to him what are the choices I'm taking 
and based on what idea I'm increasing or decreasing the values. I think we have faced this together as well, right? Yeah, yeah, true. So uh, this is where your some kind of your previous or past experience comes into play, where the the same data which looks like uh, which looks uh, patternless to someone may hold patterns for someone who is very familiar with the domain. Okay. So hence, uh, as data scientists, we generally, uh, when we study data science, we, we generally try to study it as an, uh, what do you say, a domain independent field. Okay. We're saying that, okay, whatever tools and methods we're looking for, it can be applied to any domain. It can be applied to sales, to engineering, to art, to, to uh, commerce, and I don't know what, what not. we can apply it anywhere. Okay. So data scientists generally, we, we say that, okay, we, do, we don't really know much about the domain. Even if we don't know much about the domain, we can work well with the domain. So in those cases, you can, you can actually uh, join yourself with domain experts. And in most teams that uh, we companies understand that. And that is why you would see that the data science generally will not work alone. You will have a team of people and at least few of those people in the team may be, may be very closely related with the domain. So they know details or uh, uh, interesting things about the domain, which they can help to, to bring on the table. And we can use the experience of these domain experts to identify how many clusters uh, uh, needs to be with the data. So even though, uh, so the point is, even though uh, when we are trying to cluster, we, it is very difficult for us to know how the clustering will work out, but we can rely on intrinsic grouping we can rely on domain experts and we can also know that there is no actual best criteria and everything is very, very subjective to, to case to case, uh, to data to data and from uh, domain to domain. Okay. Now uh, let's look at some possible applications of clustering. Why would someone want to do clustering? Uh, so let me show you some. So one is called as data reduction. Any idea? Of how we can use clustering for doing data reduction or uh, what will be uh, okay or maybe what do you mean by data reduction what could be the use of data reduction group similar kind of data mm -hmm. that will uh, reduce the number of categories that's a kind of reduction okay okay Great. so uh, generally we, we like generally we, we would want to have a scenario where we have loads and loads of data because uh, more the data, better the algorithm. Uh, sorry, more the data, better the, better the uh, learning and thus better the prediction and so on. Generally we want more amount of data. But sometimes what may happen is uh, many of our data are actually not helping us to learn. Most of our data, if if that data belongs to, uh, uh, what we say, belongs to a similar group, we would say that this data is probably not very useful. So let's say if I'm, if I'm doing something like this, and I'm trying to maybe, let's say for even for supervised learning, if I have data like this, and I'm trying to learn what is the actual boundary? Uh, what is the boundary between these two parts, uh, which will help me isolate, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, which will help me isolate between the two classes. Okay. So my known data, I know my known data lies here, but my unknown data may, may have any uh, feature value and any feature value here. So I need to know for each feature value, what is the uh, case? Do, will I put them in the red group or when I put them in the green group? And in this case, what I really need is, uh, or let me give you an example and then let me ask you which one is more helpful. Okay. If I say I have a new data point here and if I say I have a new data point here, okay, which one do you think helps me more? This one or this one or this one? Left side one. Left side one, this one? Yep. Okay. Any other answers? So, okay. in fact, <laughs> when there are two options and I ask any other options, then 
uh, it, it makes it easy maybe this one is the right answer can you tell me why this one would be the right answer because that point can be grouped either into red or green depending on hmm. okay so okay uh, this this is the right answer of course but you see i am trying to learn this boundary okay so things that are closer to the boundary will help me learn this boundary should be uh this way or should i would i be drawing this boundary this way in in lack of this data it is very difficult to go choose option a or option b if i don't know this one but putting this one data point helps me clarify that this one is definitely not to the boundary does that make sense now in in this in this scenario this data point does not help me at all this just confirms what i already know make sense yep okay so uh sometimes we have loads of data let's say i have loads of data but loads of that data is not actually helping me learn the boundary the boundary is very useful for me to learn because if i learn the boundary then for unseen cases i can tell which one is the uh, which one belongs to group red which one belongs to group green and so on so uh, data reduction is basically an example where uh, we can take groups of this data clusters of this data and we can tell since i have so many examples and maybe not many examples are useful for me i could try to reduce these examples and uh, to reduce these examples i would want to know i i don't want to reduce examples that for cases that i do not have i don't want to reduce examples for cases that i don't have so depending upon if you have more data we cluster them together and one of those application of clustering would be now that i know which data belong to one group i can i can try to reduce or delete some data points and you know get something out of it uh second reason could be uh second application of clustering could be find natural clusters and define their unknown properties okay define natural clusters find natural clusters and define their unknown properties okay. now this is uh very very interesting uh, and th there are many applications that okay so let me share with you some examples so uh, let's say uh, uh, facebook as an example is trying to collect data from loads of people data like what is their demographic uh, where do you come from uh, what is your age what is your education what is your background okay and depending on that uh, it would want to and it would cluster you into certain groups okay and uh what that clustering can help us find out is once you have clustered them together you could then try to find unknown properties be behind them okay like what are your friend circles or uh, or uh are you uh, uh more interested into uh science and technology or are you more interested into certain kinds of brands of t-shirts or glasses and so on and once we have found the cluster once we have found clusters which are naturally joining together which are naturally uh, uh, there present within the data we can then try to define unknown properties regarding this data that is will this uh, will this group of people um, be more likely to vote a certain uh, uh would likely to vote for a certain uh, political philosophy are they left or right or are they more susceptible to buying certain brands of things and not and these clusters and finding their unknown properties can then help businesses to expand or can help businesses to to use that information and show targeted targeted ads or increase their sales and revenue and so on okay so that is again another major reason why uh, clustering can be where clustering can be used or we can choose find useful and suitable groupings and once we have useful and suitable groupings then we can so these are actually two different cases uh this one and this one here we are saying uh can i so let's say if if i have let's say pe people who use t-shirts i can measure their heights and weights 
and I can tell probably that uh, the T-shirt that they'll be used will be small, medium, large, Excel, and so on. And and that grouping is very useful because that grouping uh, tells me, uh, depending upon my user base, how many more T-shirts do I need to print, and which category do I need to print them? In, okay, depending my users. So let's say a brand like Nike uh, uh, would say that my 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 most of my users are about the age of maybe 18 to 20 and maybe below below 40 to 45 that is my user base okay so uh, i would want to print t-shirts or i would want to print uh, merchandise within those groups of people okay so that grouping is very useful for companies like that in the second case we say that uh, uh, we, we are not grouping them into known categories. We are actually trying to see what is natural clustering, what clusters are naturally formed, and for those natural clusters, what are certain things that we want to know from them and output from them. Okay. So that is finding natural clusters and defining unknown properties. Okay. Finally, maybe one more example, where we can find unusual objects based on, based on clustering. So let's say if we cluster all of our data together and we see something like outliers, I think, I think we've discussed outliers. Uh, we can actually find outliers using clustering methods. Okay. So let's say if I have all these data here, so I've got loads of these data points and uh, we find some data like this. Then I can say that these guys are actually outliers. Why? Because 99% of my data are very close to each other. Whereas few data points are not close to each other or they are out of the ordinary. They are out of the pattern. And that can, uh, that kind of clustering can help us do a lot of things. Okay. So one example that I, I've got a friend actually working uh, in Amazon and he works on uh, a, a credit card fraud uh, cases where uh, as people use credit card, so let's say uh, uh, if you look at my credit card and you look at normal transactions, so you would see, okay, in, in a month I have maybe 20 to 25 transactions uh, and all of these transactions would either be within my local area, Bangalore, where I would either use it at a DMART or at a shopping mall and so on, or I can have some online uh, transactions from uh, uh, websites like Amazon or Mintra and so on. And that would be the normal usage of my credit card. But suddenly, if you see that my credit card what you, was used in Norway uh, at a time that I should be sleeping, uh, then my credit card company would, would either send me a message or give me a call saying that we, we saw unexpected behavior and uh, we are actually worried if your credit card is lost or not, or can you confirm the transaction? Okay. And I, I think many of us may have experienced that either through credit cards or even, I, I think Google does a very good job. Uh, normally you would be using your own devices, mobile phones and stuff like that. Suddenly when you log in from a totally different device, uh, it would probably give you uh, a message that, uh, is this really you or do you know about this transaction or not? And you would notice that this would not happen uh, 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 all the time as long as you are in your same behavioral pattern. Okay. But something out of the way. So whenever I log into my company uh, system using uh, Google or something, it gives me an error or it gives me a warning because uh, you would use your company network proxy or something which is not based in India. So it, it seems to Google that you're, you're logging in from a totally different place. And then it, it pops out that alert message saying that, uh, is this really you? Okay. Now, those things like that uh, is basically an application of, of unusual objects or it's an application of outlier detection. Uh, the, the algorithm has seen you perform uh, so many times that it has tried to learn what, what do we mean by normal behavior. And based on normal behavior, it is able to cluster all the categories into one place. And sometimes when you, you do something very odd or uh, different, and based on those different features, 
it can tell you that okay this is way apart from Norton okay thus it is an outlier or it, it can be a reason for concern and then it reaches that warning up Arand, I, I saw in between you unmuted. Uh, were you trying to say something? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. 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 So again, uh, this is again one more application where clustering can be used. Now, uh, interestingly, this is an unlabeled data, right? For, for we know uh, if you are an authentic user or not, but Google does not know if if you are the true user or you are not the true user. So for Google, this is actually unlabeled. It does not know which is what. And still, it is able to uh, group things together, which is basically an example of uh, clustering, example of unsupervised learning. Uh, before going ahead, maybe there is there is one more category where unsupervised learning can be used, and it's it's a fairly uh, fairly new field, I would say, but a, a field that is gaining a lot of popularity in recent times. Okay. Have you heard of an algorithm or? Have you heard this word before? Gans? Okay. Uh, none of you have heard Gans before? Let me probably try to explain. This is actually very, very interesting. So Gans stands for something called as generative adversarial networks and uh, the, the the very interesting thing about these kind of algorithms are that they can be very creative in nature okay so first first of all it, it also comes under the unsupervised category because it does not expect uh, labeled data okay uh, what we are trying to use gans for is they are trying to create new forms of data. Okay. So let's say I, I show you 100 examples of cats and dogs. Okay. So 100 images of cats, 100 images of dogs. So after that, hopefully, I would want you to learn what do you, what, how to identify a cat and how to identify a dog. Okay. But a more interesting thing to do is after looking at 100 images of cats and 100 images of dogs, can you create one image of cat or can you create another image of a dog okay. and uh, that is the kind of things we are trying to do with GANs that is after looking loads of photos we want to create new photos like the ones that you have seen or after listening to thousands of hours of classical music can you create new classical music or after uh, listening to thousands of hours of uh, country music or any other form of music or can can you create more of that? Okay, and that is actually a true sense of learning, right? Uh, uh, if if we truly want that our algorithms or AI should one day uh, be so advanced that it will be able to think for us, in those cases what we want is we want our computers, we want our algorithms to represent or to tell us what it has learned. Okay, so Gans works on that principle by pitching two algorithms in front of each other. Okay. You have a generative algorithm and you have an adversarial algorithm. Okay. The generative algorithm, let's say you have trained this, you have trained this network with lots of images of cats. Now generative uh, network will predict an image or it will give an output of a cat. Okay. And adversarial network will tell, is this, uh, is this uh, what he said does this look like a cat or not okay if it says it looks like a cat then our algorithm is trained we have and we have an actual algorithm that can spit out the images of cats or this adversarial network will say sorry this is this does not look like a cat but when it says it does not look like a cat it also gives a feedback on why it is saying that okay it also gives a feedback on what is the problem does this image not have ears or the shape of ears is wrong, or does this image does not have uh, whiskers or nose or eyes and the, the type of image is wrong. It will give feedback to this network. And hopefully with this feedback, this network will come with a new image of a cat. Okay. And this network will again say yes or no, depending upon what is the problem and give again feedback. After you train this over a 
while, your generative network will start to become better and better at predicting cats or predicting or showing new images of cats. And your adversarial networks will become better and better in identifying is, is, is something truly an image of a cat or truly not image of a cat. Okay. And over a period of time, the, gen, the hope is that generative algorithm will win over adversarial. It will, it will throw an image which adversary will say, okay, this is a true image. Even though this is not true, even though this is artificially generated, the adversarial network will say this is a true image. And once that happens, we know that this model is trained. And now uh, this model has learned enough from the images of cats that it can give out new images of cats. Now, why is this an example of unsupervised learning? Because we, we truly don't need a label here. Okay? We truly don't need a label. We can have thousands of images and then we are trying to, we are trying to train a model to learn the underlying principle, the underlying system that is able to take this out. Uh, you may have seen applications of this uh, in multiple ways. Uh, in between, there was a famous app that was trending, uh, which was if you click your own image, a selfie, you can actually increase or decrease your age and show how that photo would look like uh, uh, you know, after 10 years, after 20 years and so on. And you can also go in the past and you can probably guess how the photo would have looked like five years earlier. Uh, have you seen that? I have seen the status of people's. Oh, you have not used it. Huh? No, I haven't. Uh, it's, 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 it's actually very amazing. Uh, and uh, the amazing part is, uh, it's a machine learning algorithm, which has, which has learned, which we have loaded with loads of data, which is able to gen artificially generate a new image uh, because it has understood how probably different images work as, as age increases or reduces. So it's a very good example of GANs and this forms under the category of uh, unsupervised learning. Okay. Uh, recently, I, I have seen there are, uh, even on Kaggle actually, there, there, is a, there was a challenge where uh, we have uh, artificially generated videos, uh, videos, okay, not just images. So images is, I, I think images is, is uh, still difficult. But now we have, we are to a level we are, where we have artificially generated videos where uh, uh, you could, let's say, you could make Trump say anything you want. Okay. You can write a piece of text and you can uh, either record another person uh, uh, saying something and you can train a network to put uh, uh, who has learned uh, uh, based on thousands of hours of watching Trump. It has learned uh, what, is what are his mannerisms, how does he talk, what is his attitude, what is his facial expressions. And, he, and that algorithm can take Trump's photo and map it to this other person. So that when this person speaks, it seems like Trump is speaking with the same language, with the same dressing and so on. Uh, you can just imagine the havoc that can create a, in society. Uh, so Kaggle has come up with a challenge which helps us to identify uh, or asks us that how do you identify how do you train a good algorithm that can do this part well? That is identify if something is fake or not. The flip side to that is if you know something is fake, then this algorithm can also tell you why it is fake. And then the other part can go and improve that. Okay. So uh, I, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, uh, nonetheless, it is moving in that direction. Okay, we are moving in that direction. Yes, this is another very, very interesting example. Uh, another very, very popularly uh, gaining traction, trending algorithms within machine learning. Uh, it falls under the category of unsupervised learning. Interestingly, uh, it, it's a very advanced topic to even start discussing or start implementing. So we'll limit our discussions to basic clustering for now. We'll see how that works out. Probably next class, I'll talk about clustering approaches. And we look at how these algorithms work and what would be the strategy, uh, how we can implement them and so on. Okay. Do you have any questions? No, Elijah. Okay. Great. In, in that case, let us stop for today. Uh, see you guys uh, on Monday morning. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye.